Let's show Matilda a lot of love tonight and hopefully we can get her to move back to San Francisco. <laughs> Please welcome Matilda Bernstein Sycamore. Thanks so much for bringing me. Thanks to the library and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so let's see, tonight I think uh, some of you might know that in uh, Sketch to See, Alexa, the narrator, who is a 21-year-old queen, uh, in 1995, and um, in 1995, one of Rebecca Brown's books came out, and that's The Gifts of the Body. And in the book, Alexa reads The Gifts of the Body. Um, and so that, that is a chapter in the book. Um, it's a chapter I've never read aloud, but since Rebecca Brown wasn't able to make it tonight, I thought that chapter I might read. Um, it's, a li it's quieter than some of my chapters. I generally like to read the loudest parts. <laughs> um, but of course, I always like to say before the reading, you know, whatever you need to do to take care of yourselves, feel free to do it, right? If you need to laugh, cry, jump up and down, you know, take your shoes off, go to the bathroom, buy books and run out the door, you know, scream, yell, clap, you know, whatever you need to do, please do it. Uh, I always say the only bad audience is the dead audience. <laughs> and I can tell this audience tonight is not going to be that one. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna read and then of course we'll have time for questions, conversation, controversy, explication, extravagance, transformation, all the good things. Um, so yeah, I'm, I think I'll start by reading just a little bit from the beginning so you can get a sense, and then I'll read that other chapter. Um, so yeah, uh, like I said, the book takes place in 1995 in Boston, and the narrator, Alexa, is a 21-year-old queen. I think that's all you need to know right now. <clears throat> and how's my volume? Is everyone hearing me, everything? Okay, good. Perfect. Oops. the way you're gonna be. I'm at the other side with Polly, trying to figure out which is worse. Straight celebrities who wear red ribbons to show they really care about their dying gay friends, or gay people who wear them instead of actually doing anything. Maybe they should all move to the suburbs so we don't have to deal with them, okay? And this boy, Andre, who Polly knows from Bagley, leans over and says, that's bullshit. I'm still strung out from coke, K, pot, and ecstasy a few days ago. Plus, I'm getting over a cold and all I've had is a double shot of wheatgrass, and I'm waiting for the waiter to bring me my food so I can write in my journal. <laughs> of course, Andre is wearing a red ribbon. But Polly was wearing one when I met her, and she figured it out quickly enough. Girl, I say, it's just an empty symbol. And that's when Andre starts screaming in my face, I'm not a girl. If I wanted a girl, I'd sleep with a girl. I'm a man, a 21-year-old, HIV-positive, Latino gay man, and I like the suburbs. What's wrong with the suburbs? If I want to move to the suburbs, I'll move to the suburbs. I don't want to live all my life in a ghetto. You can rebel all you want, but there's no way to fight your parents. They're the people who made you. The way you're brought up is the way you're going to be. And I say, we're brought up to hate ourselves, and we can go beyond that. But he just keeps yelling. If I wanted a girl, I'd get a real girl. A girl with a pussy. If I wanted a woman, I'd have sex with a woman. I like the suburbs. I want to live in the suburbs. I grew up there. What's wrong with the suburbs? <laughs> then he walks off like we're mortal enemies. And I'm thinking, I need food, I need food, I need food. Get me food right now. Where's my food? I go to the bathroom. And when I get out, I'm about to light a cigarette. But then I think, smoking's disgusting. 
So I go back to the table and tell Polly I'm quitting. And of course she looks at me like I'm crazy. My soup finally arrives, but now I can't focus on eating because some straight asshole behind me is saying the stupidest things. I mean, I guess he's on a date, so he's trying to sound romantic. He just said, I have to confess something. I've never given flowers to someone I don't know before, but I really like you. I do. You remind me of my sister. <laughs> Maybe it's time to look for another pair of combat boots. I mean, the duct tape on these looks glamorous, but it isn't going to last through winter. Polly's too cold, so she decides to go home. Girl, bring a coat next time, OK? <laughs> By the time I get home, it's already dark. And as soon as I get inside, I hear something awful on the stereo. Are you kidding? It's Aqualung. I get to the living room, and there's Brian with two of his buddies from the Coast Guard. Everyone's yelling, and there are beer cans everywhere. I feel like I'm in a frat house. Polly, Joey, Bobby, and Billy are drinking with the straight boys like sorority girls. Bobby giggles and says, want a beer? Gross. I walk into my room. Even though there's nothing in there, everything's still in the living room. That's what I'm supposed to be doing tonight, moving my shit into my room because I'm finally done painting and I got the new carpet and everything. I call Joanna, who tells me she went over to Jack and Jamie's house and some man turned blue and they were smacking him trying to wake him up and someone else was screaming and crying and Joanna started laughing and said, okay, let's get high. She says, I don't know if I can kick. Heroin takes care of me. I want to say, come stay with me, but what the hell would she do in Boston with a bunch of Coast Guard assholes yelling in the other room? So instead, I say, you can come here if you know you're not going to get strung out. Joanna says, listen, our relationship can't be the way it used to be. It hurts me too much. I'm getting close to a woman for the first time, and you know our connection was fucked up. I say, what do you mean? She says, I know we kept each other alive. At one point, you were the most important person in my life. But you're on the East Coast now, and I need space to love women, to feel the fear and get somewhere with it. But why are you putting me to some distant category? Why can't you just talk to me? So then she starts talking about speedball. It's the most amazing feeling. All the colors in your head like you're part of the sofa and everything in your body is a door. The lights on and off, on and off. And I say, that's not a sofa, it's a broomstick. <laughs> and then we're finally laughing together. Even if her voice still sounds hollow in that heroin way. Joanna tells me she's going to help Jack kick. Jack told her she'll be shitting and throwing up in bed for seven days. Please call me, Joanna says. And when I get off the phone, I need a cigarette. But then I remember I just quit. <laughs> Maybe I need a shower. But now I'm thinking about San Francisco and how Joanna wants me to send her the papers I've written for school. But I'm embarrassed because I feel like school is draining away everything I learned when I left school. I mean, every time I hear someone say ontology, or epistemology, or reify, or whatever other stupid theory bullshit, I want to die. <laughs> I call Melissa, who says, what would you do if you thought AIDS was a government plot? And suddenly, it's like everything in the room is vibrating, too dark and too light at the same time. And I get that familiar feeling like someone's behind me. My father, I know he's not behind me, but should I turn around? Melissa's saying something, and I feel like I'm starting to cry, so I say, hold on. Where am I? Breathe, Alexa, breathe. OK, this is my room, my new room, in Boston. My father doesn't even live in Boston. There's some annoying classic rock in the background, a few tears. I pick up the phone and say, sorry, I was getting an incest flashback. And Melissa says, oh, I'm sorry. 
There's something in the way her voice changes so fast to meet the situation. And I'm thinking about when we met in ACT UP and how she would never say anything at meetings, but afterwards, her analysis was so clear, clearer than anyone I'd ever met, and she'd left school too. Melissa says, I had a dream that I had sex with my father, and I wasn't scared. I'm scared now. I tell her I can lend her money to move out, but she doesn't want me to. Why? I say, why? I can't, she says. There's something I still need to figure out. I hang up the phone, and then I'm sitting on the new remnant I put over the old carpet in my empty room, because the landlord wouldn't let me tear it out, and shag carpet is disgusting. Talk about allergies. I make a list of all the people I love, and there are five. <laughs> Ooh, is it warm in here or is it me? <laughs> I'm sweating. Great. So that gives you an introduction um, into the book and the various themes. Um, so now I'm going to read from this chapter, which is toward the end of the book. Um, and this is where Alexa, the narrator you just heard from, where she reads The Gifts of the Body. And she is in a, uh, she's a hooker, and she's in a kind of, I don't know, how do we call it? Some sort of living situation with a trick. Um, and that's, um, yeah, that's, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to set up. You know, it's still, still in Boston, still 1995, and the book has just come out, and they're reading it together. If I can find the right page, let's see. Here we go. Between your heart and the fabric. I would never have imagined reading this book with Nate, but he came home one night and I was sitting at the dining room table sobbing. No, I'd already stopped sobbing. I was just looking at the wall. Or not the wall really, but in that direction. You know how you can look right at something, but you don't see it? I was thinking about when I first heard about AIDS. Maybe I was 12, and it was Rock Hudson and the Inquirer, and I didn't even know who that was. A famous actor, my mother said, and the headline told me he died of AIDS. Liberace, too. Pictures of him really scared me. I didn't know what to do with those pictures. I just knew that I was going to die, if anyone knew, knew about me. And they did know, so I knew I was going to die. In The Gifts of the Body, the narrator is a home care worker for people dying of AIDS. And when I opened it up the first time, I got scared because the writing was so simple, and I wondered if all these deaths had changed Rebecca Brown's writing. When Nate asked what was wrong, I handed him the book, and he said we should read it together. So now I'm already crying again on page two, which is numbered four. The narrator's talking about leaving little surprises under the pillow of the person she's taking care of, or rearranging his toys so the toys are kissing. Rick loves surprises, Rebecca Brown writes. And then on the next page, Rick is on the floor or no, I guess it's not the floor, it's the futon in the living room where he's curled up in fetal position, writhing in pain. The narrator says to Rick, I'm sorry you hurt so much. And I'm thinking about how much I hurt, how much everyone I've ever known hurts, or everyone I've ever known who's meant something to me. And what about the ones who act like they don't hurt, like nothing's affecting them at all, like Joey, Look what happened to Joey. And then the narrator does something that I can hardly believe. She gets on the futon with Rick. 
She gets on the futon and lies on her side and puts her arms around him as he's sweating and in pain. I'm kind of relieved I can still cry like this in spite of the cocaine cure. I'm only on page seven and this book already means so much to me. The home care worker is cleaning the apartment while Rick is in the hospital. She wants Rick to come home to a place that's soothing. She avoids the kitchen table. There's something she saw there, and when we find out what it is, when I find out what it is, that's where I'm crying again. Rick had gone out to get cinnamon rolls like he used to, after his lover died, but before he'd also gotten sick. He'd gone out to choose the softest roles, one for himself and one for the home care worker. And now he's in the hospital. The narrator closes her eyes and lowers her head toward the table, and I'm thinking of tears, tears at this table with Nate, and how he's still not looking up, which helps me not to try to change anything, and I wonder if he knows that. There's something about no one else knowing someone is taking care of you, Rebecca Brown writes. If Mrs. Lindstrom pretends the attendant is just there on a visit, on a visit saying hi, maybe if she just pretends, all this can become pretend. I look at Nate again, and I wonder what we're pretending. Ever since I told him about Joey, he says he's not in the mood for sex, so I cook dinner because Nate says he's trying to get healthy, though I'm sure he's eating bacon and eggs for breakfast and a hamburger for lunch. But it's almost cute how he asks all these questions about my cooking and then forgets everything I say. We sit down and talk like husband and wife or father and son or maybe just friends. That's the best part when it actually feels like we're friends. Every now and then, Nate wants me to give him a massage, and then when I get hard, he says, oh, let me see that. And then he jerks me off until I come on his chest. And then I hate him again. I should be reading this book with Avery, but he doesn't like reading. And anyway, he said he didn't want to read a book about AIDS. But what about Joey, I asked. Don't you want to think about Joey? Joey's gone, Avery said. Joey's gone, and he's not coming back. What's there to think about? It's so surprising, when you cry and when you don't. The narrator tells Ed that he can check into the hospice and then leave if he wants to, even though she's never seen anyone leave. Is this an act of kindness? The narrator is so caring and detached. She feels so deeply for these people she only knows through their illness. And I wonder if this is what community means. Ed turns down the hospice. He's enraged, making contradictory demands. He's a child and an adult. He wants to have a garage sale. He wants the option to leave his house again on his own. The chapter is called The Gift of Tears. I'm getting used to the light of this chandelier. Nate's behind me, placing another cocktail to my right. Thank you. I wonder if I want him to touch my shoulder but then he doesn't. I'm thinking about the way death brings you closer to childhood. Does that mean into or away from pain? The way the narrator washes Carlos's hands, arms, armpits, feet, his innocence at experiencing touch with and without its implications, and then the fear. That's the childhood I remember. Can there ever be innocence with so much fear? Mrs. Lindstrom, who asked the attendant to call her Connie, she Sarah converted from a blood transfusion when she had a mastectomy, before blood was tested for HIV. She has a gay son, Joe, who feels guilty because he thinks he should be the one dying. His mother never did anything wrong. I'm thinking about this shame we all carry. The shame that means we deserve to die. Connie, holding on to her routine and hoping that if she doesn't mention she can't eat, maybe she'll be able to eat. Ed says, there won't be anyone left to remember us when we all die. And I wonder if that's already true. How Avery has taken Joey's place at the clubs with all the different sized vials. And no one even asks. No one even asks about Joey. 
We sit in his apartment, and it's like we're ghosts. These people want so much. This attendant, she tries to provide what she can, maybe more. When the epidemic started, there was a shorter time between when people got sick and when they died. That's a line that really gets me, because this isn't the beginning of the epidemic anymore. But one minute, Joey was telling us, and I didn't believe her. I really didn't believe her. I thought it was just another cruel joke. It's all frozen in my head now, like we're still standing on the esplanade in the snow, and Joey says, I'm dying. I'm dying. And the next day, she went home to her parents' house in Brandywine, Delaware. I thought we were going to visit. She told us we could visit. She told us there were castles there. I thought we were going to visit the castles. I remember that queen who came to our house in San Francisco to look at a room, and she wanted to do touch healing on everyone. I was appalled. I saw her around a few times, and she always acted like we were really close. And at first I was annoyed, but then I started to like seeing her. Then the next time I heard about her, it was for her memorial. Or Thomas, who arranged all these candles on the bathtub before we had sex in the bath. And I was like, what are you doing? We don't need candles. But he wanted it to be romantic. It was romantic. In six months, he was dead. I had one friend who went to every memorial he heard about, even for people he didn't know. But I didn't want to steal other people's grief, as if there was a limited amount. Now I wonder if I should have gone to all those memorials. Maybe reading this book with Nate at the dining room table is some kind of memorial. But what are we going to say when we're done? Like a bunch of 95-year-olds watching their generation end. I close the book for a moment and drink the rest of my cocktail, and I notice Nate's shifted his body to the left, and I've shifted to the right. So we're not directly across from one another anymore. What is a lie and what isn't? Like when the narrator tells a new client that his former attendant misses him, even though she's never actually met the attendant. And when the new client says, I miss him too. That place between your heart and the fabric on your chest. The fabric on your chest and the world beyond. The narrator learns that her supervisor is leaving. She's leaving because she's sick. Another of these moments that feels like a shock. A shock to the narrator, a shock to me at this table with Nate where I keep crying and he doesn't look up, except this time he does, just briefly. And then he reaches over for my hand and I reach for his. This gesture that happens so often in the book, and maybe it feels nice here too. Although it's hard to reach that far across the table, I mean reach that far and keep reading at the same time. So I pull my hand back softly, and I smile. Nate smiles, too, and then we both go back to reading. It's not that this book doesn't have flaws. It's just that there are so few of them. I'm getting to the end of my third cocktail, and there's that feeling in my head that must be chemical, the perfect combination of liquor and coke, invulnerability on ice. It's what I need to channel in order to fuck Nate. Right now, I could easily bend him over that white sofa. He would laugh in that drunk old guy way and say, let's go upstairs. Maybe I'll never have to do that again. The book ends with Connie's death. The ending is nothing but sobs until I have to put the book down and go upstairs to piss. I've been holding it for too long. I study my face in the mirror. Under my eyes, there's a rash, and my lips are pressed up into a child's frown. I can't decide whether I need a bump of Coke, but I do one anyway. And then I wonder whether closing the book with the death of an old straight woman is dishonest. 
I go up to my room and lie on top of the velvet comforter and stare at the chandelier, floating in a way, but also sinking. Eventually, Nate comes upstairs and stands in my doorway. He looks like he's in shock. I sit up, and he sits down next to me on the bed. For a moment, it feels like we're in the same place. Okay, stretch. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stretch a second while I get ready for questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, of course you're welcome to ask anything you'd like. I am doing two more readings in the Bay Area, and every reading I read something different. I never repeat myself in the same city, that is. So I'll be reading uh, Sunday at Alley Cat. That's with Diana Cage. And then I'll be reading on Tuesday at East Bay Booksellers, uh, formerly known as Diesel, in Oakland. So uh, feel free to tell your friends to come out. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting reading that chapter, because uh, you know, obviously it has a different emotionality and feeling all the emotion in the room. So thank you for that. <laughs> so yeah, what questions do people have? Oh, good, I get to stretch more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sit here and stretch while, while you think of the questions. <laughs> you can stretch, too. <laughs> yes? Um, so I, I, this is the first time I've, uh, I've seen you read. It is... Alexa, your voice, or is that, or is there some other voice? Well, so Alexa is um, the main character of the book, um, and definitely all all the books I write, I really are voice driven, and so in perfecting the voice, I really always want to edit anything that gets in the way of that. So, I mean, Alexa is a 21-year-old queen living in Boston in 1995, and I was a 21-year-old queen living in Boston in 1995. So there are definitely, I'm definitely drawing from my own voice and my own experience, and especially in terms of the details of Boston, like I was really meticulous about wanting that. There are differences. I think you know, probably the main difference is, you know, I lived in Boston, and I was like, get me the fuck out of here, and I left. And I think what I wanted to explore in the book is I don't think these characters can leave. Um, I mean, it's an open question, but Alexa is definitely the most scathing and the most politicized, but there's no place to have that met, you know, in Boston. And so she has a radical queer analysis, but she's trying to actualize that inside gay culture. It's not queer culture, you know, and, and it's a gay culture that is regressive at its core, you know, you know, racist, misogynist, homophobic, uh, transphobic, uh, classist, you know, the whole thing. I mean, we're all very familiar with that gay culture, right? But I think in Boston, it's even more magnified, you know? And um, so in writing The Voice, I wanted to kind of explore how, um, like, she's working against that. I mean, that's like her vision, but also how she's trapped in it. Um, and so, so, yeah, so I think that's where maybe it differs from my own voice. And I think also, um, but yeah, I think for me in, yeah, in writing, I always want to make sure that like the, peop the readers are entering on the terms of the narrator. And, and, and in any reading, like I do want to inhabit, you know, whatever the emotions are. But, uh, but yeah, I think, and I think part of what, uh, I mean, it's interesting because when I first started writing the book, I did, it was about my own memories of the time. And then, but it really shifted fast and became like, because the trauma, I think, of that time period came through. So the trauma of Boston, the city rapidly afraid of difference, the trauma of that gay culture, the trauma of 1995, and also these characters, you know, they're mostly are like 19, 20, 21, 22. There are exceptions like Nat, Nate is an older character, you know, in his 50s. Um, but the main characters, you know, they've all grown up uh, with AIDS suffusing their desires and no way to imagine a way out. And I think, and actually in this chapter, which you don't totally necessarily see, but 
you know, Nate has not been out for his life. And so the amount of time that he's been out is the same amount of time as Alexa, even though she's 21, she has more experience in, in gay and queer cultures. And so, like, him reading the book, it's a shock because he actually did not experience it, even though he is of the generation where that would have known all their friends would have died, right? And Alexa is the next generation. So I also kind of wanted to explore, I mean, there are a lot of things going on, but, but that was also this generational question. Like, I think in a way, the book becomes this generational story. And that I definitely did not intend when I started to write it. But it's this, this generation, I, you know, it's not the generation of, of people who like grew up and experienced sexual liberation and then watched all their friends die. Uh, but it's the generation that grew up with no possibility of imagining anything else. So there, was no, there wasn't the liberated moment to begin with, but there also, you know, yeah, so it's this in-between generation that I think I think, you know, when, you, when I write a book, I don't necessarily know why. And, but after I wrote it, I was like, oh, I know why. And one of the reasons is, is to have that conversation, because I feel like there's this weird conversation, I think it's like a dominant media narrative right now, that like there is this generation that lost everyone, right? And then there's this generation that knows nothing. And like, so obviously all narratives about, and especially anything about generations, is generally a lie, but like, because there's always overlap. But the, in here, in this case, there's a really obvious link, and that's there's a generation in between, you know? There, you know, and so that loosely is people who grew up, you know, when they were coming of age sexually, like basically between 1983 and 1996, you know? And so somewhere in that time period, and I feel like that story is really left out. Because it's like, so, and even I think sometimes people read this book and think of it as the other, the previous generation, because the narrative only has two, right? So this is obviously not a generation that quotation mark knows nothing or doesn't know trauma, which is also I think a complete lie because everyone, there is no queer person, especially not like you know a male socialized fag, you know, or anyone who who does not have that trauma somewhere, you know. So, um, but yeah, so I think in some ways it kind of became that generational um, story in some ways. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, you can get a lot of information when you ask a simple question. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's funny, in the book, they're always talking about going to Provincetown. Um, spoiler, they never make it. <laughs> um, but I think Provincetown, and, and the people that do talk, and the, uh, yeah, it comes up a lot because, you know, it's a dominant, you know, place in Boston or anywhere in New England. Um, but I think, I mean, I think there was something else you know, let's say in the 70s or 80s, which I did not experience, but I could say, you know, Provincetown anytime like 90s and beyond. I mean, it gets worse and worse, but it's kind of like, it's the nightmare of assimilation like times 10, you know? It's like, I mean, I lived there at, like a for a little while after, it's after this book takes place. So this was like in 2000, the book takes place in 95. Um, and I mean, it was, you know, in that time I lived, I was living in New York and I needed to get the hell out of New York. And um, so I moved to Provincetown temporarily, you know. And, and I was there before the season and then I was there during the season and I was there a little bit after the season. But like, I, it's like, I mean, before I was there, I thought the worst possible nightmare of assimilation was Chelsea. You know, like Chelsea, Muscle Queens, you know, the whole like fashion. It's like fashion meets masculinity, I mean, what could be worse, right? Like, hyper-masculinity, like, mandatory, you know, but at the same time wearing, like, $3,500 of designer clothes, but trying to make it look really butch, you know, like, this is real, you know, this is my, yeah, I'm wearing these, you know, Gucci jeans. <laughs> and that, you know, so, so I always thought that was the worst, but, like, when I saw Chelsea Queens in Provincetown, I was like, girl, she's edgy. <laughs> so I think, and I think there's this thing, Part of it is the closet, the, the, the living closet, you know? A lot of people who are closeted in gay couples go to Provincetown, and it's their one time when they can feel liberated. 
And that to me is really depressing, you know? It's not necessarily depressing for them, but for someone, you know, and, and I think, and I also think like New England itself, you know, is very cloistered. And Boston is the worst of that, actually. I think some of the smaller places in New England are somewhat, like I think, say, Providence is more, is a more, little more interesting town. Like places like Worcester, like there are, th or even Western Mass, you know, with all the college towns. So there's like some interesting things going on. But Boston, and I think Provincetown, like magnifies that. It's this, it's like you go there, and just because I lived there, you know, it's different if you just go for a few weeks. It's gorgeous. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. Like, two-thirds of the town is protected dunes. So it's a national park, and you can just, like, walk through the dunes and get lost in them. You know, there's no development in that side. And there can't be, because it's, you know, it's a park. You know, it's protected. So, and I, I'd never been to, like, a beach like that. You know, it's on, you know, right on the ocean. and it's, So that's gorgeous. I mean, the light is incredible. You know, it's like, because it's the peninsula, and it's the only place on the East Coast where the sun sets over the ocean. Um, and so, you know, you can walk on the breakwater just as the ocean meets the bay, and it's like, you know, so it's gorgeous, right? But like culturally, it's, it's empty. It's like absolutely empty. And it's only, I mean, that was, I haven't been there in 18 years. And, you know, now they have literally like a Gucci store, you know, like things like that. I don't know if it's Gucci, but they have, oh, Marc Jacobs, that's what they have, of course. Um, so, you know, next to like the saltwater taffy store and the, you know, the trinket shop. And, you know, it's like, what should I get? Saltwater taffy or Marc Jacobs? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I think it's, it's yeah, and also it's, it's because it's, I, maybe this is true. Well, I'll just say for Provincetown itself, like, um, the, that cloisteredness, it's like if you live there, if you move there, let's say, you're immediately, like, I mean, this happens, this is just gay culture, but it's so magnified. It's like within three days, you've been put into a group. And like no one outside of that group will talk to you, right? So like for me, it was seasonal nightlife. You know, nightlife workers. See, those two. It's actually like two overlapping groups, right? So there's this other group of like wealthy gays, you know, or even like literary, you know, province town. But like it never intersected, you know, because you've already been put in this thing. You know, there's the people, yeah, the vacationers, and then there's the people who live there, you know. So there are all these. It's just like mad, and it's tiny, right? It's like in the summer, you know, they're probably I'm not sure, but. On, Full season, it's like 2,000 people or something, you know? Like in the summer, it might be like 50,000. I'm just making those, those numbers up, but like something like that. Um, it's probably not, maybe it's not 50, but it's, it's a lot bigger. Um, but yeah, so I don't, I mean, there is a great cruising area, I mean, you know, called, it's very subtle, it's called the Dick Dock. Uh, <laughs> it's like underneath one of the bars, like on the bay, and it, that's hot, you know, I'm all for that. There's sex in the reeds. There's a lot of, of nudity, which is great, you know, like, uh, even though it's technically illegal, but, but it's not, yeah, it's really empty, I would say, you know, overall. I mean, and of course you could go and have, like, I could go now, maybe I could go and, like, you know, teach a writing workshop, and I would have a whole other experience, you know, like, but, but I think overall it's gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I'm interested in um, the queer voice and the queer politic, particularly um, the way it connects to liberation. And a lot, of, a lot of the sort of bold queer voices that I hear in, in your work and other works is, is actually sort of trapped in a lot of ways, even if they're, and for me, sort of queerness comes with liberation. Like there's a way in which to live that out, you kind of have to sort of find a way to be liberated. So I'm wondering, um, where's the liberation for Alexa or other sort of um, faggots like me, you know, who just sort of, uh, to me, that's the politic of queerness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think 
for me, in, in the book, I really want to explore that tension, right? So it's a tension between having a radical queer analysis and not being able to actualize it in the world. So, so for, for Alexa and for the characters in the book, they are trapped, you know? I mean, it doesn't mean there aren't moments of liberation, but I'm, one of those moments is drugs, right? The book is called Sketch to See. There's a lot of drugs. And drugs in the book are the way that community is formed. So we know that that's corrupt, right? But it doesn't mean that it's also not real. You know, and so, so I think for Alexa, you know, in the book, sort of the pageantry of gay club culture, you know, instead of the nine to five, you know, reality, it's like the 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. reality, right? Not intersecting with the workaday world whenever possible, right? And of course, that's not possible because it's Boston, and so getting on the T, you know, people are telling you they want to kill you. You go out, and all the, you know, the queens are telling you that you don't deserve to be there because you're too queeny, you know? And uh, so, so for me, I want the book is really about that, you know, in the larger world. And I think, but I think we all come uh, come up against that. There is no place that I've found that is truly liberated, you know. And I think we always have to work toward that. But I don't think it exists, you know. And I think the worlds that I have once believed in and that have formed me, like in many ways are just as corrupt as the dominant, you know, worlds, you know, that sort of magnify the same kind of hierarchical viciousness and sort of, you know, transform it and maybe make it a little more, you know, a little more sophisticated. But, but it's the same thing. And so for me, I think we always have to work against that. And so being liberated is, is it is a personal choice, and it, but it also has to be about, like, challenging dominant, you know, structures of power, whether they be in the larger world, that where it's kind of obvious, you know, that like, you know, homophobic or transphobic straight people, you know, or institutions or laws are wrong, right? That's obvious. But what about homophobic or transphobic queer people? <laughs> like, you know, and the, and the way that becomes internalized. And I think the way that becomes internalized is central to this book. You know, and like, like even just the way that like, let's say the way AIDS comes up in most, um, you know, most of these queens that are in the book, it's, it's basically like, oh my God, sh stay away from her. You know, she's got AIDS, right? And that's just that standard gay shade, right? And so, so yeah, I, I kind of wanted to explore the, that tension. So I'm glad you caught it. <laughs> Did I see a question over here? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, um, so I'm curious, and it came up in the reading a little bit when you're talking about Joey and kind of this like cultural communal forgetting um, something that really struck me about the book was how these figures just continuously disappeared mm -hmm. throughout the narrative. So, like, ones I can think of off the top of my head that really affected me reading was, like, Polly mm -hmm. with, like, one, like, kind of, like, what would be, like, a D-trans moment that they confront mm -hmm. her. Or, like, Joanna, where she's met, but, like, then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And there's always this kind of anti-climax to that where it's, like, people just kind of disappear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering, that feels to me, and I don't know if this is intentional, kind of co like countered by like the very end of the book where there's like this moment of like remembering someone through like their ashes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could talk more about this kind of, like the way that in these like communities that people kind of just disappear and there's like no trace of them anymore. That's something that really resonated with me as mm -hmm. someone who like has lived lots of places where it's just like a constant churn of like new people, but like then all the things that happened five, 10 years ago or like who knows what happened, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that great analysis. I love that reading of the book, yeah. So I think it's funny because I think generally, you know, when I write a book, I always, and you know, the editors are looking at it. I think often they ask questions like, you know, like, oh, well, this character came in at the beginning. Why aren't they there in the middle? And I'm like, well, they're not there anymore. <laughs> you know, that's how our lives are, right? I think we're told, like, when we write fiction or when we write a book, it's like, oh, you have to tidy everything up, right? You have to, like, if this character is here and there was, like, sort of a romantic interest and it never went anywhere, but don't you want to bring it back? And I'm like, no, I don't, because it never went anywhere, right? And I do think there is that, I think, um, 
And I think in the book, these characters, they're in a way, you know, Alexa is trying to create family, you know, a chosen family, and, and succeeds at different times, but then it just completely falls apart. And it falls apart in lots of different ways. So, you know, with Polly, in some ways, it's, it's her childhood um, of living in like a Christian fundamentalist upbringing that sort of brings them apart. You know, with a character like Joey, it's death, right? Or, um, you know, some of the other characters that come in and out. And so, yeah, so I really wanted to, to have that. I do, I agree that I think in, um, in queer worlds, it does, and maybe this happens everywhere, but since that's what I know. <laughs> uh, but there are these things where it's like, you have this incredibly close relationship that feels like family, and then, you know, two weeks later, it's gone. And I think that is, speaking broad, like outside of the book, you know, I feel like that is one of the big tragedies of like, it's one of the places we've really failed, you know, to create, because like when I was, you know, when I first, imagined, you know, creating like family and love and intimacy and lust on my own terms. Like for me, I knew it was permanent. And I knew these relationships that I was building when I was like 19, 21, 21 um, were permanent, right? But I was wrong, right? They all, they're all gone, you know? And um, there, with a very few exceptions. Um, and I think part of that is because we've still internalized the fact, the idea that it's not real, you know? And, and that's why I think so many people go back to their blood family, you know, even if it's horrible, right? Because like, and it hasn't changed. You know, I see people like, you know, like now, you know, I'm 45 now, so people, you know, who are like in their 40s, like 20 years ago were like, I'm never talking to those horrible people. And now we're like, I'm talking to those horrible people because <laughs> like, because they feel like they've lost everything, you know? And it's not, and that's true, you know? And so, so yeah, so in the book, I really did want to, and I always had to push back a little bit with editors because they're like, oh, I want this to be more tidy. And I'm like, well, no, I don't want it. It's not tight. Like our lives are not tidy. And I think as soon as you change the life to fit the narrative, then it's no longer, it doesn't have any power, you know? And I think, and that's dominant publishing is that model, right? That you can, you can have now, you can kind of like squeeze in a non-mainstream life into a very mainstream form. And then it's like, oh yeah, this is okay, you know? And especially if you have the right pedigree, so you know, you went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, you got a Stegner Fellowship, you know, you have like, you know, an agent at the Wiley Agency. Then they're like, okay, now this is a brand. I can, I can publish this brand, you know? But if you're pushing back against the narrative form at the same time as creating, you know, some sort of like, uh, a challenge to that status quo, then I, I think there are very, very, very few things. And you don't have that pedigree. You need those three things. So um, so I think, yeah, so in the book, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you caught that because I really did. And I love that interpretation of the ending, too. Um, you know, because there is this, this thread in the book of Alexa has the ashes of, of a friend who had died and she doesn't know what to do with them. And she keeps, you know, it keeps coming up you know, here and there, and she has fantasies about it, and something happens in the end. I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so thanks for that question. Other questions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, so moved by that chapter and hearing you read it live, and there was... I just felt the layers in it, and I wanted to know more about your writing process, and I'll try to put into words what I felt. It just seemed there was this emotion with her sobbing and sobbing while reading, so that that intense emotion existed, and yet it was it was subtle in the sense that in the writing it didn't describe the emotion, right? And then there's the hate, suddenly, of the sex, and all the other layers of distance with Nate. And so I was wondering in the writing, I mean, I'm, I imagine, given how much you edit, that you kept stripping away some of the more obvious sentiment. And I just want to know how you arrived at that beautiful ending with we were finally in the same place. Uh -huh, maybe, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> yeah, great. thank you. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, so I think um, for me, especially that chapter, 
I'm working toward feeling, right? And I think for me, explication always takes away from the feeling. And so, so it was an interesting process of writing, because of course, you know, I was re rereading the book, and you know, there's a lot I can draw from. And I, I did at one point have a lot more between segments of the book, and then I was like, okay, that doesn't, that it doesn't need to be there. And I don't need to describe, if you can feel the experience of the reading, then you don't need to be told like, how the emotion comes up in that certain way. So I wanted that to be kind of the mechanism. And the part at the end, yeah, that was the part where at one point I did have more kind of like, um, and I felt like that moment, because here is this, you know, relationship that isn't a relationship. It is and is not a relationship. And then there's and that tension between it. And, and it's like they're experiencing something else through reading this book. And so for Alexa, you know, she, in order to survive in Boston, you know, and she has to, you know, she has this scathing analysis, right? And she's on all the time, right? And if someone's telling her they want to kill her, she's like, honey, I mean, please, like, what, whatever, you know? And because that's how she can, she can survive, right? She can't let anyone see that they are making her afraid. If she has to, because because then she's not, I mean, she's not actually safe, but then she can't even feel that she can exist, right? And so I think, in a way, and this happens with a few books in the book also, when, uh, a few books, a few reading a few books in the book, where, you know, she also reads uh, Memories That Smell Like Gasoline, the David Wonorovich book. And I think, so let's take The Gifts of the Body. This is... It's how she's able to access her own emotion about what's going on in her life through this other text. And there's this kind of camaraderie um, with, you know, it's a, it's a generational camaraderie that she doesn't have in the actual world, you know. And so I wanted to show that by showing the experience of reading itself, you know. And so that's, that's where I think I kind of pared it down. Um, and yeah, it was a little tricky because it's also, yeah, because it's mapping out this other relationship with Nate. And then his relationship with the book is, is a different one, but it's also this opening. And so I think, I can't remember how, I think it was just through feeling that, through like feeling this moment of closeness with them that I realized like, oh, that's what the book does, right? The reading of the book, uh, of The Gifts of the Body. Um, and... Uh, and it comes up in a different way in another chapter where, um, well, I won't spoil it, but where, where they're together and it's a different relationship to um, being in the room together and uh, having a closeness that's also a distance. Um, so. And also, yeah, actually, I remember, I really, really, like, I don't know, it's, it's interesting, like I was really picture, I can picture that exact moment. And I think the picturing of it, for me, it actually helps, but I don't, I don't want to describe that picture. You know, I want you to feel it, you know? So if it was a movie, then I have it all in my head. So if someone wants to make that movie, I've got it, right? So you need that. <laughs> uh, but yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Can I ask you whether you were aware of the book, The Gifts of the Body, in 1995, in that setting in Boston, and in what way that book influenced your life at the time, if you were reading it then, and if you recall, or if you knew, um, how was it received at that time of publication? I know it won this award, but a Lambda Literary Award, but was it received in a in a larger way within the the community at that time or just only in literary circles was it really a part of what um gay men were talking about at the time or queer people were talking about at the time a this is a series of questions <laughs> bring it on because <laughs> on that way and b um do you know rebecca brown in seattle um, and did you come to the book later only from being in Seattle and being exposed to whatever fame she has there? And see um, that sort of radicalism that you're looking for, or the, the, the sort of ideal radicalism that you're talking about vis-a-vis -vis 
queer liberation, which you talk about in your other books too. Um, do you feel like that exists now in Seattle in a better way than it did in Boston? Or do you think it's here in San Francisco or Oakland? Or, or where is it? I mean, is there a locus for that now? And is it in the United States? Is it international? Like, where is this <laughs> mythical place where people have their chosen family that actually stick around? And not only that, they bring a radical analysis to the political scene, and they're effective at changing everything. In a way, that was more effective than what I saw going on in Boston in ACT UP and other radical and anarchist organizations in the 80s, which included gay men and included lots of people working at GCN, including people like Michael Bronsky, and all kinds of incredibly effective, important people in Boston to me at the time. <laughs> um, so Sorry. yeah, so yeah, I read *The Gifts of the Body* in 1995 when it came out. Um, I got it at Glad Day Books in Boston, um, and and it did it blew me away. And I think that was the time that was the time in my life when I would read any book about AIDS, you know. And there were many books that probably the most impactful books of my life. I mean. I would say, you know, Close to the Knives and Memories That Smell Like Gasoline by David Wanarovich. Um, uh, Life Sentences, which is an anthology by Thomas Avena. Um, Cookie Mueller's writing, actually. Um, uh, David Feinberg. Um, what is it called? Something Loathing. It's his memoir. Um, so, oh, uh, Jill Quadro, or Hill Quadros, um, City of God. Um, and so this was one of those books, you know, where I saw it. I already knew her writing. Um, and so that's, yeah, and so it did, but it struck me as like, I was like, oh, this book is different. And I think it, it was her breakthrough book in a commercial way. So it's hard to imagine now, but like writing about AIDS until like the late, until actually, until like say 97 or so, until it changed, this is an interesting thought, I hadn't thought of this before, but ironically, once AIDS, you know, changed into, or HIV changed into a manageable condition for many, you know, due to new drugs that actually helped people stay alive instead of just killing them, I feel like that's the moment when writing about AIDS was no longer considered commercial and also was not even published as much on independent presses. But in the mid-90s, like, Gifts of the Body is on HarperCollins. HarperCollins at that time was the dominant commercial, like, um, uh, literary press, you know, and, and, the, and it was, and so it, it made her into a commodity in a certain sense, which before that her writing, and the, her, if she was here she could tell this exact story, but, but I would say before that her writing was, you know, read among, say, literati and in queer worlds. And that book, I don't know who read it, but it was definitely, you know, had a commercial uh, visibility. Ironically, it's out of print because of that, you know. So that's the weird thing about publishing is like, you can have a very successful book on a commercial press, but they're not going to keep it in print. You know, that's, a, that's one advantage of being on an indie press. Even if you can't reach the same audience, it could be in print 20 years later. So, so that's been out of print for a long time. Um, the question about where is the place uh, for queer radicalism or queer radicals or where is, where is that politic actualized? I don't have the answer. <laughs> Unfortunately. But I, <laughs> but I do want to say, I feel like, and there is, it is interesting because there are places at different times in, you know, in our lives that, and in a broader sense, you know, like San Francisco certainly is a place that historically has that imprint, you know, and it is the place that formed me and formed my analysis. Um, and obviously San Francisco doesn't have that possibility in the same way anymore. And I, I, I'm struck actually, this is the first time I've been here when I, uh, I, I have a hard, I've had a hard time like feeling that I'm in San Francisco, you know? It's the first time that that's actually, I mean, and I have to like, like I've been walking around, like just, to, I'm like, it doesn't, I'm so, I can't feel it, you know? And so, like I found myself, I walked to like the first place I lived in San Francisco, which was in 1992. 
um, on 26 in Florida. Like, I just found myself walking there because I was trying to find something familiar, and I was like, I felt nothing. I mean, it felt a little, but I was like, you know, I was like walking around. Like, I mean, the last 10 years I lived here were, was in the Tenderloin, and that was the place that was most, like, where I felt like, just felt like was home, you know? And um, so I haven't actually, that's what I'm gonna do right after this reading is walk around the Tenderloin to see if I can feel it more. But like I kind of like avoided the mission which was the place that had formed me. And, but, but I found myself walking to the mission just to try to feel something. And I was like, like to like encounter people that I could imagine like were in some way like me or something like that, you know? I, I saw like one, you know, on the whole like, you know, you know walking for like an hour or two. And uh, and the only people that actually that and this you know I haven't been there that lo here that long. I'm just talking about just my experiences of walking around. But the only people who I see on the street who a lot of my life takes place like walking around. This is how I like have like this is why I live in a city. You know what I mean? Is so I can walk around and like have random interactions and um, and and so I I notice the only people who really like look at me like one of them, you know, where they're like, oh, I relate to you, are people um, who are homeless. And I feel like that's where the people who are the fringe have become, you know, literally the fringe, you know. And um, like I was, I was walking down, you know, 7th and South of Market, and, you know, there was someone like in a, like red Afro wig and like, um, in a wheelchair and um, and was like, you know, like, like just looked up and was like, hi! And I was like, okay, there it is, right? But it's like so marginalized, you know? It's like a totally different experience than like, you know, feeling like, oh, I have this neighborhood where people were, even if it's corrupt, right? Where it's still like, oh, you know, like this is a queer space, you know? And, and I, and you can walk down the street and you're like, oh, who's that, who's that hottie with the like dyed red hair? And be like, hey. And then they stop on their bike and, you know, you're like, let's get tea or, you know, like, who are you, you know? And I, that's like someone who I met in like 1993 and who I just saw at a reading in LA, you know? And um, so, so I so but I do think on a broader sense, you know, you know, we're living in, you know, the dominant colonial power in the world, right? So anytime we're living, we're living in a terrible place. And like we have to make something else anyway, you know. And so and I think we can do that anywhere. Um, it may not take place in the same way. Um, or in the same forms, but I think we have to like struggle against it and try to try to create it, even if it's in moments. Um, I mean, I hope it becomes more than moments. But um, and the last part of your question, I do remember about Seattle, um, is not better. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. There's great air. The air is great, fresh air. There are beautiful trees. Um, culturally, it is dead. Um, so, and people are very cold, distant. Um, not that, I mean, there are exceptions, you know, and I'm, I'm going, I've been away for about like seven or eight months. Um, I'm going back and I'm going to make, just like I just said, I'm dedic I'm making it happen. <laughs> At least, you know, so that I can feel like I have a home. Because I haven't felt like I've had a home since I left here. <laughs> uh, so maybe we'll take one more question and then of course we'll have time for private questions. We'll have time for book signing. Um, and I love hugs. So if anyone wants a hug, I've got hugs too. So last question, please. Uh, thank you so much. And the reading was beautiful. And it's so wonderful to see you, Matilda. And your analysis is so incredible. You're so brilliant. And you're so missed here in San Francisco. And, um, I love this idea that, that you're writing about and talking about the chosen queer family and how tempor temporary and almost ephemeral, you know, the relationships are, but yet our relationships with our queer literature is what sustains. And to hear you writing about a book from 20 years ago and has me thinking, just about my own, you know, queer 
library, of which your books are among, <laughs> that I return to again and again and again. And these are the relationships that have lasted and persisted, you know? The relationships with our queer books, like that is our queer life, that experience, so thank you. I love that, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think that was, uh, that question had its answer in it, right? <laughs> but I will say, I think for me, you know, like when I was first like coming of age as an avowedly queer person in the world, when I moved to San Francisco when I was 19, like, yeah, one of the way that I like found culture and community and relationships was through exchanging books, right? We were all like, we would read some book and, you know, one thing I remember, you know, books like, it was when I was first remembering that I was sexually abused and reading Bastard out of Carolina was the first time that like, um, that I had seen that experience in writing. I mean, I might look at it differently now, but at that time it was like a life changing book, you know, or, um, uh, well, certainly like, you know, David Wonorovich's work or Shereen Moraga at that time. Or I remember going to this reading actually, it was, um, it was at the women's building. And I, at that time I lived right around the corner and it was, um, it was Dorothy Allison, Shereen Moraga, June Jordan, and Adrienne Rich. And, <laughs> and that just seemed normal, you know? It was like, like, oh, and I was like, who's this old white woman up on that stage? I don't even know who she is, and that was Adrienne Rich, you know? And because people were like, really, you know, because she was the four, she, you know, there of the next generation after her. And so people were really like, Adrienne Rich, and I was like, I don't want to hear her. <laughs> uh, but like, you know, and I think, um, so that is powerful hearing you say that, and I think that is one of the things that I wanted to show in the book, right? Also is like how literature becomes like, like a lifeboat in a certain way, and also a way to like, for me, I think the really important thing is, is to feel, right? It's like, I mean, yes, it gives us an analysis. Yes, it allows us to see ourselves and to, to like, think of new ways of living, you know, and taking care of one another, and also it's to see all the horrible things that are going on in the world, you know, all of that is there. But I think also it's that, in the book, it's really, it's, it's a way to feel, right? And it is this intergenerational kinship that isn't, I think we've, you know, I think as queers, we've done a terrible job of having that, you know? And AIDS, of course, had a huge impact on that because people literally died. But I think also, you know, that the legacy of like of ageism in queer worlds in all directions is so extreme that it prevents that kinship, you know, especially because I feel like the only way generally, I mean, the most common way is, is just if it's eroticized, right? That's not enough, you know, that's, that's not, that's just another fetish, you know, mostly. Instead of having, like, create, like, if we're going to create structures that are, like, not predicated on the violence that we grew up with, you know, if we're going to create something that, that is, and, you know, it's funny, because I had a friend once who was like, why do we even use the word family? I mean, it's so gross. Like, we need something else. And I've come to believe that, you know, we need something else. But it needs to be something that's more and not less. So, so I think I'll leave, and this feels, this feels familial, this feels communal. Um, so thank you. And like I said, I'll be here to sign books, to answer private questions, to give you hugs. And also, socialize amongst one another. If you see someone, you're like, who's that? I haven't seen them before. They, or you're like, I like that question. Go up to people and chat. People you don't know, especially. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.